Hello and welcome to the second episode of the 8th series of the Temple of Surf, the podcast. Today with us from California is movie director Jason Balfa. We discuss with him about movie making, surf, surfboards and much more. Hi Jason, welcome to the show. Where are you today? Uh, I'm at home in the Santa Barbara, California area. And uh, it's a little gloomy today, so it's a good day to, to have a nice chat and a morning espresso. <laughs> Definitely. Like a tradition of Italians, you know, like breakfast is espresso and maybe a little uh, croissant. A little dolce. Yeah. A little dolce, exactly, you know. So Absolutely. We will talk about uh, Italy, of course, uh, today. We must, right? The first question I ask everybody on the show is, in your opinion, What is the most important thing in surfing? Oh, my goodness. Good question, right? <laughs> Just uh, to start. Yeah. And you've maybe had this answer before. I think it's to have fun. You know, I think it, as soon as we lose that, that joy that the first wave gave us, you know, because we want to get more or bigger or get deeper in the tube or whatever it is, um, I think that's not a good thing. I think remembering um you know why you fell in love with it in the first place and maybe that's true for anything a place uh a, a significant other right we we have that initial thing that grabs us and life goes on and our perspective changes and it's always good to reset uh and remember that feeling um and it's it's frankly for me why i ended up riding more longboards as i grew older i i learned more on a shortboard And every time I grabbed a longboard, uh, my, my good friend's dad had an old Velzy, classic single fin, wow. 1960s Velzy. And we would take it on trips. And when the waves weren't good enough to shortboard, I'd ride this longboard. And that riding that board always gave me the, the spark of why I loved surfing. So now I have a bunch of longboards and, and I try to grab that spark whenever I, whenever I can get away from work or the family, you know? Yeah. But, you know, it uh, actually is a kind of uh, the nostalgia, but also the uh, enchantment that those old boards are are creating, right? Because even surfing like a, a shoreboard, but a classic, right? Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's always some, there is always like a, a little added value, right? You are. You are It, yes. It's an interesting thing. And you mentioned nostalgia. I mean, that's a good word. I think there is something when we connect with sort of this other time or, or the, the roots to it, 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 at least for me, it kind of elevates the experience. I, I certainly paddle out and I think about Bruce Brown in the end of summer and how all those waves look so perfect and everybody's having fun and it kind of transports me to, you know, wherever I need to go on that day. Yeah, definitely. And I remember, you know, uh, uh, the first board, uh, I, I actually uh, collect a few boards, a few boards myself. And one of the first boards that I ever got was a, a Greg Knoll Atomic uh, model. Mm. And when he arrived home, it was so heavy. And I was like, what? How can it be? You know, like, it's impossible it, how, how they could surf those waves, you know, thinking about like uh, back in the 60s, 70 or the 70s. Uh, the board was so heavy, but I, I guess the it's part of the journey, right? Carrying it on, suffer a bit, and see it sliding like fast. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's nice. true. I was talking to Josh Hall about that because he loves building bigger boards, and I think I said something like, "Oh, do you think this would work pretty well in Hawaii?" And he's like, "Dude, look at what those guys were riding in the '60s. Uh, you can ride anything if you want it. You just gotta want it." So. So. Uh, and his are obviously a lot more refined than what they had, but you're right. It's a thing and it, it beats up your body. I mean, I, you know, I've had some knee and other back issues because I love writing heavy boards. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to learn to do less, you know, and, and not try to surf aggressively and, uh, growing up around Tyler Hadzikian and watching him surf in your head, you think, oh, I should be able to do that, but he's a superhuman. So. <laughs> we need to remember, you know, our human abilities and kind of stick to what we know. Exactly. Exactly. We should all take our own space and try not to have it all. Otherwise, it's going to be very complicated. And yes, 
the answer that you gave me regarding what is the most important thing in surfing, uh, it's kind of a standard answer that everybody, most most of the people give, but it's not that easy to remember because in effect, quite a lot of people, they do not have fun while surfing. Yeah. Could be why, because they have personal problem and they bring it to the lineup or maybe because they go into the lineup to create problems <laughs> or <laughs> sometimes, or uh, also um, talking with uh, some of the competitive surfers, you know, like they are not used, they don't want that competition anymore. And the competition takes away the pleasure and the fun, you know, like uh, talking in uh, about the Italian surfers. One of the first episodes of the podcast was with, was with Roberto D'Amico. I don't know if I don't know if you if you know him. It's like with uh, Leonardo Fioravanti and all this. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And he was telling me, Alessandro, you know, in my competitive years, I ended up throwing up every time I was going to to surf because the pressure was too much for me. And now that I am like a free surfer and I travel the world, I travel Italy and I surf, I'm much, much more happy, right? So it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean... I great grew up playing American sports and, and surfing was not a big part of my life when I was little. I, I would body surf and put fins on and, and I love the ocean, but where I live and my dad wasn't a, a surfer, you know, he liked to body surf, but I, he taught me football and soccer and American baseball and, and track and field. And so I, I, I was very focused in that. And I remember before football games, I was similar. I'd have an upset stomach all day. I wouldn't eat normally. Those those games would be Friday nights in, in California. And um, when I finally connected with surfing on a surfboard, it was such the opposite for me. I was, and, and I think that's why I fell in love with it. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is not that world. This is this other thing where I'm in a place and a space that I love so much. And um, I think for that reason, I've never done competitions or even wanted to. Um, but like you said, there's certain days where it's just competitive because of the nature of the lineup. I mean, Italy is a, a very aggressive area of surfers who want to just have fun. And there's a lot of energy and excitement. And managing that can be hard uh, because it's a it's a fleeting resource, you know, and I think we forget that sometimes. But I do think that that is part of it. It's this thing comes and goes and you can't always plan it. And so we all want ours, you know, when it when it's good. Um, but the strange the strange psychology is having interviewed a lot of people myself. I think most surfers will say if they get perfect waves, they'd rather share it with a few people than be alone. Mm. So there's this really weird balance of you know wanting to share it, this idea of aloha, and then also this kind of selfish. <laughs> I need mine. I need to get you know enough. So. It's a fascinating thing, and that's probably why so many of us have spent years, uh, you know, obsessed with it, for lack of a better word, right? Yeah, you know, like uh, when I was talking with Joy Cabell, uh, he told me, like Alessandro, back in the 60s, we wanted somebody to come with us, not only because it was a safety, right, thing, because we had yeah. a body that could, but also because we wanted to have somebody that could confirm that we were surfing the biggest wave. And if we were by ourselves, <laughs> it's actually interesting because if we were by ourselves, those were only stories at the bar. But because yeah. there was somebody that could certify that we surf that wave, that actually was a good reason for them to be in the lineup, obviously. Classic. <laughs> right. Or a cameraman, right? That's the yeah, exactly. the career of many a cameraman, camera person. Exactly. Uh, it's it's a funny thing. We all we all want to show off, but <laughs> uh, you know, uh, yeah. I don't know. No, but it's it's okay. It's like uh, those 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 early days. You know, there were only a few people out there, so different uh, synergies, different uh, rule, rules of the games than today, where obviously everywhere is super packed. Maybe China is still an <laughs> yeah. explore territory. Yeah, for some. It's interesting, though, that idea of, I was visiting a friend whose name I, I won't say, but a very good surfer. And he builds surfboards and he's he's in an area that's pretty remote and he's not there's no cameras allowed where he serves. I don't even think there's leashes wow. allowed technically. So he 
And he's surfing, we surfed, and he's surfing as good as he's ever surfed, if not better than when we were younger. And um, I could tell he was a little frustrated because he's like, ah, I'd love for some of my sessions to be captured, you know, to, to share that. But at the same time, there's rules and I've fallen in love with this place and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to follow those rules and, and not do any stuff like that. So I think at the end of the day, he and I need to go on a trip somewhere so we can <laughs> show off how well he's surfing. But it's, but I, it's a fascinating thing that way. I guess any surfer in this world, maybe less the Instagram surfers that another typology of surfers, every surfer in this world, in this world will trade will not trade empty waves with a camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. empty waves is such a rare thing that you forget the camera. We don't want, we don't need, yeah. you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> Put it all up here, right? Put it all exactly, up here. exactly. It's only the mind. <laughs> Fantastic. So tell me about you as a film director, of course. Uh, what were the two, let's say, milestones, in your opinion, they brought you where you are today? Wow. Well, you know, I, I'm one of those lucky or weird people where I, I realized I enjoyed something young. So a first milestone would have just been being exposed to filmmaking uh, through my cousin. So my dad's brother, my dad's Italian family, Calabrese. But uh, the my grandparents, my Nono and Nona came over when my, before my dad was born. My brothers came over on the or his brothers came over on the boat. And we all ended up in California. So we were close as a family, a good Italian family. And we'd go to barbecues at my uncle's house. And his son, my cousin Chris, was older and already studying film. And um, he had the old Super 8 reel-to-reel wow. and doing a stop-motion photography. And it just, it captured me. And, it, you know, I was only about five, but I Star Wars had kind of just been starting to come out and all these big movies that we look back on as influential. And and so I just knew. And my parents were supportive of it, which is amazing. So from there, you know, as a kid making movies with my friends, going to film school in Los Angeles, Loyola Marymount, where um, I was very near El Porto and El Segundo, where I got to know Tyler. And so that was a big moment because I think I, my surf obsession started edging into my film obsession. Growing up, all I focused on was film and playing sports. And then all of a sudden there was this surf thing. I was like, oh, OK. I might spend a little more time doing this. <laughs> and then that, that for good or bad, I think, you know, I, I started in a Hollywood job out of college and I was in an office and we were making, you know, big TV shows and starting to do movies, but I wasn't happy. I would dawn patrol before work and I'd come in blue and freezing. And mm -hmm. back then it was kind of rare. So people in the office were like, what are you doing? Like, Why would you get in the ocean on a winter day? And but I just loved surfing. And eventually that job I transitioned out of it. And um, I went on what I call kind of a walkabout phase where I just traveled as an artist and, and surf and spent a lot of time in Hawaii and got to go to Mexico and, and just really wanted to get. My theory was if I got good enough at surfing that I could go anywhere and meet people and experience new things, then that would be my bar. And so I was just head, head into it. And um after a while, I ran out of money, <laughs> and my parents were like, "You need to get a job." Yeah, and uh, I, I fell into a TV show called Blue Torch, which was U.S. based. I don't know how much international play we got, um, but we were producing action sports, so surf, skate, snow. And the the team there realized I love surfing, and they invited me to come help and produce media about surfing. And and that was when the light bulb kind of went off of like, "Wow, I can combine these two things," you know. And um, so I worked there. It was we were working really hard and kind of grinding because the show was every day and just it didn't feel as creative. But I was learning a ton. And as that show started to die, <laughs> I said, "I'm I'm going to make a movie." You know, that's what I grew up wanting to do. I'm going to make a movie, and I should do a surf movie because I love surfing. And someone told me if you're going to do your own movie, do do something you know and love. And I think at that point. I never realized documentary was sort of my thing. I think the idea was just, I'm going to make a movie and it'll be about real people. And, you know, that's where Singleton Yellow came from. And um, obviously that was a big moment for me because it, one, it was just an amazing experience making it um, and traveling alone and getting to spend time with David in Japan and Bo and um, obviously Tyler and Devin, Daisy, but um, Bonga. It, um, 
what what was need was that people liked it. <laughs> you know, it came out pretty good. Um, yes. And that allowed me to keep doing other things. You know, had had everyone hated it, it might have been a different career. And, and maybe it would have been more, <laughs> more Hollywood. I might have gone back to Hollywood. Um, you, know. you just never know. Never know. know. And um, so that pretty quickly transitioned to One California Day because Mark Jeremias uh, had become a good friend and helped a little with Single Fin Yellow. And we said, well, let's do something else. And, you know, the, the crazy thing is each of these projects is years. Single Fin was four or five years. One Cover Day is four years. Um, so, I, you know, eight, ten years later, here I have two films, but it's kind of, I, I wouldn't say I had a career. Um, but One Count Four Day was good because it, it got me into doing commercials, which obviously for any young filmmaker is a great way advertising to not only make some money, but learn because you're okay. usually experimenting and, and playing with toys. And, and um, but again, I love making films. So it wasn't long into the commercials that I looked at my wife and this idea for Bella Vita came up and I said, I gotta, I gotta do another film. I gotta do this. I love working with Chris Del Moro and I'd love to do something about Italy. And, okay. um, and so that was a huge moment, you know, and, um, and on the backside of all of that, I, I going into my, you know, late thirties was sort of thinking, geez, I, I kind of wish I'd written something and done that classic Hollywood movie. I'm doing all these documentaries. Oh, yeah. I was working on Lo Looper's, the golf movie. It's called Looper's, the caddies long walk that Bill Murray narrated, which was yeah. super fun. amazing. And, you know, so each of these things were kind of these learning experiences and these moments in my life that kind of reflected where I was at mentally, you know, with single fin, I wanted to see the world with one California day. I think I wanted to be home and a little more insular with Bella Vida. I just had my first son. So I think I was a little bit nostalgic to family and, you know, where my grandparents had come from and wanted to go with my family and spend time there. And, um, you know, I'd gotten into loopers and I was kind of uh, missing the Hollywood movies that I like watching. Yeah. And so I started writing. And so as I speak to you now, I, a lot of my focus has been on writing and developing projects that are more traditional. Um, the thing I've learned in COVID put a huge, you know, train wreck in the middle of it for all of us, but it's, it's a lot harder to get the wheels of that machine up and running. And um, documentaries, if I have a camera and a backpack, I can go make a movie, which yeah. is very exciting. But I was totally focused in it. And then my longtime friend, Chris Callen, called and said, Disney wants to do surfing. Would, would you be up for it? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was surreal because at the time, I, I literally said, I'm not going to do surfing. I love it so much. It distracts me. I got to focus on this but here was this weird you know hollywood beast and this thing i loved and the opportunity to to see if we could make it all fit together and um you know of course i, I said yeah I, it, it was such an interesting challenge um surprisingly emotionally and you know covid made it hard because we produced in multiple countries a lot of it i did from this computer as a remote director because you couldn't travel Mm. Japan was closed. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it became an exercise in sort of communicating my vision, hiring people that, you know, we could trust and also empower them to go be creative, like get out and just play, you know, and have fun. And here are some parameters. And then they'd get mad. Like, why, why do you like, no, trust us? <laughs> if you have some parameters, then we can keep this thing kind of feeling like it's one cohesive thing. And, um, you know, and that was Chasing Waves, which is now up on Disney Plus. And I, I think kind of a neat mix of Bella Vida and One California Day and Loopers and sort of this, you know, a little bit of everything I've, I've been able to do. And ironically enough, you know, a, a big moment in my life to be attached to Disney. Suddenly, you know, you start having conversations that you didn't get to have before about work and ideas. And I'm now, um, aligned with United Talent Agency. And so I have reps who are helping me find new things. So those, <laughs> it's a lot, right? <laughs> but those, those are the big, the big things. And, and I can't, you know, if there's somebody out there who's a young filmmaker or, or just an entrepreneur, I can't say I had a plan. Um, my plan was always to just, you know, make, make stuff that I was proud of. And I think, you know, I've talked to my, my co-producing partner on Chasing Ways is Chris Cowan, 
And, um, you know, we said, hey, sometimes projects, you make them and they're not always received right out of the gate. But if you just keep doing good work, I think that builds on itself. And it's like anything. If you have a restaurant, you're always putting out good food. If you build surfboards and each one is better and more refined, then that is just going to build on itself. So if there was any advice to my crazy journey, it's just, you know, try to do something you love and, and keep trying to challenge yourself and hopefully elevate what you're creating. But, okay, this is the advice that you give to somebody. But is there an advice that somebody gave to you that was and was and maybe still very important for you as a film director, obviously? Yeah, I I don't know. I can't remember a, a pivotal um, mentor. And I've had some good ones and some great teachers. I definitely had people in my life say, you know, wow, you you are focused on work that you seem to really love. You know, it doesn't seem like work to you. Keep doing that. No matter how hard it may be at times, keep doing that. And I, I got that advice and I've certainly stuck to it for good or for bad. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, you know, I think I'm a little OCD, ADHD. So it's just when I do something, I get the tunnel vision. Okay. And my my dear mom, who's, you know, in her 80s, says I've always been that way. And, and so I think when I get into these projects, it's just uh, for good or for bad. It's a little obsessive that I just want to make them as good as I, I hope they can be. And at least at least get them to a point where I, I can watch them and not cringe too much, you know. <laughs> yeah, I guess. That is, a, that is a piece of advice I actually got about screenwriting that uh, someone told me. It's if you think it's good, there's someone else out there who's going to think it's good. You know, there's so many people in this world that if you're if you're true to your sensibilities and what excites you and you get that thing, then th there's something there. And don't yeah. think it, you're weird and the only person because there's a lot of people, right? Yeah, I guess that's what makes you uh, uh, honest in your approach and relatable in the fact that uh, if you don't do compromises and you produce something that you like, you will be always genuine in the way you describe. But if you did partially or if you don't like it fully, then when you talk about it, nobody they will they will understand that you're not completely satisfied mm. you know? like mm -hmm. you it will yeah. it will be in your eyes right and i think you know that's what makes uh genuine people relatable and maybe like you said there is always somebody else in the world that's gonna like it the same way you do right? or more so it's a good thing right and, and and there's always gonna be talented people and maybe more you know and it, it, that but that's now that I'm a, a father, we have two kids and, you know, they'll have friends over and we'll make pizza. And one kid might say, I don't like pizza. And it's like, who who doesn't like pizza? But <laughs> there's someone who doesn't like pizza, you know, and someone who loves pepperoni. And it's, we're humans. Like, you can't think, you know, and this one's been hard for me trying to make everybody happy. And so it really is important to sort of find that thing that makes you happy. I talked to a director the other day who does commercials which have been hard for me to find that, that magic in because in my head, I know I'm doing it for the fee, not for the love, you know? Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, well, I do it for the love because I'm around all my friends and we get to go make something. Like, I love just the process of doing it. And I thought that was great insight. I, you know, I'm going to uh, try to use that more in my life. It's like, wow, this may be hard. This may be frustrating at times, but if I'm enjoying the journey of it then it's worth it you know yeah it does it, 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 it uh, is worth it for sure and so uh i hate to be stereoty stereotypical stereotyping, but <laughs> i cannot believe that there is somebody that doesn't like pizza at least in italy <laughs> at least in italy i don't know the rest of the world uh, but i i think all the italian love love pizza um unless they are uh, uh what's it called uh uh, intolerant to uh, cheese yes. or, or something. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is focaccia that there's no cheese in it. So we can, we have always like every solution. So in effect, uh, you were saying a lot of things. My mind is a little bit running now. Yeah, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay, I'll try. Uh, you, were, you were talking about uh, now I'm doing traditional, I, I want to do traditional movies or traditional screenwriting. Is is surf related or is you're writing about hmm. other stuff? Uh, and if you can say, otherwise, yeah. uh, 
No, I, I, it's um, it's fun because so many people in that level of industry say do something with surfing, and um, I don't really want to. You know, I, uh, I and I know surfing's hard to control. I mean, even doing chasing waves on a kind of a Disney schedule was difficult. It was documentary, but they wanted things, you know, permits and schedules and lifeguards on the beach and. Mm-hmm. As soon as you book that stuff two weeks out, the waves are going to be crap. <laughs> it's just Mother yeah. Nature goes, yeah, no, I'm sorry. So, you know, filmmaking on a traditional sense is very much about control, which makes surf filmmaking very exciting because you don't have the control Mother Nature does and you have to be fluid. I'm excited about doing a bit more structured work where the, you know, the story is in writing and, and you're working with a team that wants to execute on that specific vision. And so for me, surfing doesn't totally fit. That said, I have two things, a film I want to do and then a big scripted series. And the series is about a Navy diver. So it's all underwater. It's a lot of free diving. It's all ocean based. If anything, that's a problem for it because it's expensive to produce that. Mm. But it's so fun and it takes everything that I love out of being a surf traveler and a filmmaker and the the people you meet on the road and these crazy boat drivers and divers and you know and it it puts it into a very heightened commercial you know kind of a uh mission impossible type thriller so okay for me it's 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 my dream project and i really hope it gets out there you know you get these things in your brain and and you just want them you want to share them and um I promise I am working as hard as I can to make it happen. Because I think a lot of other people, I think a lot of other people would like it too. It's fun. Finger crossed. And, uh, but you know, like I was thinking now, just thinking, you know, in, in this generation, like these years, you know, 2023, whatever, you know, we went from a big Wednesday, okay, to maybe point break. Not the second one, the first. <laughs> or that independently, you know, uh, okay, let's start maybe. And there's some, uh, then we, uh, that was more like kind of documentary, right? I don't know. But nevertheless, uh, we have a big Wednesday point break. But in this era, we don't have any like anything surf movie yeah. that is, that will be considered iconic. Uh, right. Two years down the road. So somebody has to take the, that responsibility. So Jason, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. You know? It, we, you know, it, you, what kills me is I, I did, I enjoyed a phase where a manager was sending me screenplays that other people had written. And, um, and I would get a lot of surf ones. And it just, I think people try to find the drama in the surfing or the contest. And that's where it always fell apart a little for me. Yeah. And, and, you know, the right creative mind could pull it off. But big, you look at Big Wednesday and Endless Summer. I mean, Bruce Brown is a great storyteller. And it's about the people, you know. And um, I, I think if, if there's a way to do it, that, that's the key. Surfing is the backdrop. They are yeah. surfers. But it's not about the drama of surfing. It's about the people and, and uh, the lifestyle. So, yeah, yeah maybe, never say never, right? As soon never as I say never, never then. <laughs> yeah. No, never, 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 never. never. Maybe tomorrow you wake up with a great idea. And um, right. no, but yes, it, it is all about the people and what I think attracts uh, people that are not surfers to movies like uh, uh, Big Wednesday or Point Break yeah. is the fact that talk about people that end up surfing, you know, but surfing is just like, but of course, then you have surfers that they look only at the surf scene and look at that scene and look at that. Anyway. Whatever you cannot make everybody happy, but uh, you know right. it's uh, it's a journey. Yeah. And yeah. so let's open the chapter of uh, Italy, right? Mm. So as uh, uh, my country, you know, but also your country at a certain point, you know, like uh, so. What is the uh, the the best memory or the most dear memory to you of uh, uh, shooting uh, Bella Vita in, in Italy? Mm. Mm, wow. It was not an easy shoot because Mother Nature was hard. We got a lot of rain in October in Sardinia when everyone kept saying, normally it's beautiful. And exactly. Perfect. So my brain goes to that and kind of feeling the weight of this production. But, you know, my son was 
he's now 11. So this is how long it's been, but he was eight months. And my wife brought him over and we were staying with Pier Giorgio Castellani at the Poggio Al Cassone um, outside of Pisa. And um, my parents came over as well. And so that having everyone there, even though I was busy and they were sort of off enjoying Italy, um, getting to come back and kind of reset with them. And one dinner we did was our American Thanksgiving, uh, which is in late November. And here we do turkey and mashed potatoes. And um, we all, my dad always does a stuffing with Italian sausage. So we keep some Italian in it. But it was Thanksgiving and we were there and we said, we got to do a, a dinner. But we couldn't find all those things that we would normally do here. So my dad said, I got it. I got it. And he did little game hens. And for the mashed potatoes, we had a gnocchi. And oh. It was one of the greatest Thanksgiving dinners ever. We were there on the vineyard. And uh, I think that, you know, experiencing that with family in a beautiful place is, is something that I'll keep with me for a very long time. So thank you for sharing. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, definitely Italy is not the best place in the world to have Turkey in November uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm sure you found the, the right ingredients to, uh, to to make it happen anyway right so and uh, you know as, as someone who loves cooking it, it, that was really enlightening to me to experience to be there through a seasonal change right into summer into fall really we were there kind of going into winter and seeing how what's at the market changes and how the menus change and it's just such not a thing especially in california where it's year round you've got tomatoes and you've got turkeys and whatever and you really appreciate that concept of hey eat, eat fresh eat local let's let's not over do this the way i think we do as americans and people want everything <laughs> every time. it really was a nice learning experience i've tried to at least for a little while i tried to cook that way you get stuck in your thing you know it's uh we're very spoiled in california we're on planet here maybe you should do a movie of uh, a italo american chef that also serves in italy yeah. across the world <laughs> there you go i don't know maybe it's a shitty idea i don't know anyway <laughs> so um <laughs> you know, I, I did a very, I did a very bad rough draft of a script about making Bella Vita. So it was very much about my point of view from start uh -huh. to finish and then fanciful, you know, it's, uh, it's not good yet, but maybe someday. <laughs> maybe someday. And it would be an excuse to come back to Italy. Exactly. I've also thought that the Fracas Brothers story feels to me like you could recreate that as well. That, that was, uh, it was fun getting to meet them and hear their stories. At the end, it ends always with uh, a nice glass of red wine and some good Italian mozzarella or, or whatever, you know, so it's okay, you know. There is always, like, it's, I'm sure, a, a good end for an Italian story. <laughs> it's very good living. It's actually, when, when you reached out to me, I think I was a feeling a little bit nostalgic because I was almost going to shoot the Tour to Italia that's going mm -hmm. on, what, soon? Um, and I was in conversations to do a documentary about it, a series. And then it, it, I think they're waiting maybe next year. We'll see. You never know. But, uh, I thought I was going to be in Italy for about six months. So nice. I'm, miss, nice. I'm missing you guys. Maybe it'll happen an, uh, another time. Yeah. Visit us soon. So, okay. So then, uh, oh my God, <laughs> I tried to find the, 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 the feel rouge of my, of my speech. So we were we were talking about, uh, of course, Bella Vita is a very important moment. We're talking about uh, family. Let's talk about a little bit of a surfers. You know, I, I, you met. You were saying some of a uh, few names before. You met a lot of surfers. Uh, some of them very well known. Some of them not very well known. Let's say anonymous mm -hmm. surfers. But was there a meeting with one of them that was particularly meaningful for you? I, I think. Um... And he probably doesn't get enough credit in in sort of his his reach in surf filmmaking. But Devin Howard, who, who's become a good friend through the years, I met him when I was working for that television show. They sent me down. Um, I think we met at Costa Rica for a longboarding contest, and I was doing video work. And 
it was where I met a few of the people who ended up in single fin yellow. Uh, Bo Young and I had a blast right out of the gate. You know, that was someone who instantly I, I knew I was going to be good friends with, but Devin um, through the years has just been a big part of not only these projects, but I think my life and, and we've worked on other things together and, you know, it's it's hard not to say Tyler Hadzikian has been a huge influence because that's very true. And we spent a lot of time together. But, you know, I think as far as really being involved in some of these ideas and the evolution and, you know, Devin in, in introduced me to the Malloys who through the years became good friends. And he's just been um, a, a real kind of pillar of um, not just friendship, but, you know, feedback and creative inspiration. You know, he obviously has uh, influenced the world with his interest in writing eggs and all, mm. all these other different uh, vehicles. So it's um, I, I think he deserves more credit because I know he's helped other filmmakers on their projects. And I won't name names, but he's just he's um, he's got a great creative mind and he's also just a genuinely good person, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So props to him. <laughs> because you know Devon was part of the podcast as well so I remember having a, a very very nice conversation with him and as well uh, in terms of public is among the top 10 episodes of the podcast in ter- so he, which, uh, you know it means that uh, people follow him and people want to hear more about of course Midland <laughs> but much more than that and I think that was a uh, quite uh, interesting and on the other side you said um, about uh, Bo uh, Bo Young uh, another uh, super aficionado of uh, Italy you know because of course he was competing there with Bear as well as a sponsor and he told me oh Alessandro after my surfing session in Italy the food the food <laughs> <laughs> but you see it's easy Italian culture mama mama and food there is that's it, you know, like that's the two pillars of the foundation. <laughs> and it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it is. Um, tell me something. Uh, actually, I have two more questions and then we will wrap it up because I don't want to steal so much of your time. Um, what? Uh, how important is the soundtrack for you? Because we go back to the traditional surf movies, you know, like the one we said before soundtrack was an amazing important part of it right uh, is it still relevant today or it has changed I, I believe so yeah it's it's um because you know you're in a way you're creating almost music videos and you're creating they're lifestyle films, but I also think they're kind of action films where you have these breaks. You know, if you think of, you mentioned Point Break, the Hollywood version, story, 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 action scene, you know, and that might be a minute or two long. And the way I approach my surf films or Big Wednesday is a perfect example because it's surfing is, is to do that and, and also attempt to have each surf scene have a little more story revel- relevance. Chasing Waves, our Disney series, we really worked on that. And I, 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 I had to convince the editors to kind of look at it that way and think about what does this surf session mean? And I think the music's a huge part of that. You know, it takes the audience on this journey. And um, it's gotten a lot harder because when I made Single Fin or One California Day, musicians were making money selling CDs and doing concerts. And so they would kind of give you not give but for a very reasonable amount of money let you use their music because for them it's promotion oh if someone will see the movie they hear my song they'll go buy the cd and everybody won hmm. now they're not selling cds we're not selling dvds either frankly and um the business models changed and i don't there's nothing i <laughs> i don't blame musical artists at all for wanting to be paid a lot of money if their stuff is used in a commercial or a film or whatever because that's their way to make money now. You know, as artists, it's gotten very difficult. The problem is if you're going to go make a little independent surf film, it's hard to get the music like we used to. Um, So it's changed a little now. More often, I would lend towards finding someone to do original tracks as opposed to listening and choosing existing music. But that's just the dance, you know, And, and 
finding that. And it, obviously if you have a bigger budget you can go get the music you love and, and everyone's happy with the business arrangement, then that's a great thing because I really do think, um, you know, one of the reasons I love film is because I grew up loving writing and music and taking photos. And it is that one medium we have where it all comes together. And, um, you know, not to get too into it, but I do sort of hate that Instagram sort of taking away this audience experience with and kind of candy in your face, right? It's the best way with some six seconds of music that's famous and you just scroll through and you're getting hammered by it. And so emotionally, there's no connection. Um, it's entertaining. I kill time on it. And I know, you know, it, it's addicting, <laughs> but kind of the, to be swept into something where you really feel, you know, is, is such a wonderful part of being a human mm -hmm. and part of why I love telling stories. So um, I hope we never lose that. <laughs> Um, and like I said, as it may change and the relationship yeah. may change between the art, art communities, I think it's still important that we find ways to do it and do longer form on some level. Yeah. I like the point of view of composing because anyway, it's still part of the creation. And if we look at the major movies that have been done in the story of uh, cinema going from uh, Gone with the Wind or Star Wars, you know, the uh, identity is also created with the music yeah. you know so it's uh it's fantastic i mean th think of john williams the composer and think of what star wars to be indiana jones jaws et yeah. close encounters without what he brought creatively you know i i, I think he's the the magic sauce those guys tapped into <laughs> exactly they're, they're great filmmakers but it just elevates it and you know it's um it's fun when that happens. It's not always easy and it's hard. You have egos and you have different creative, you know, viewpoints. And so it, it is a dance to come together. Um, but it's, it's beautiful when it happens. Yeah, yeah it does. It is. Um, uh, let's be a bit uh, storytellers since we are uh, in the mood. The best wave of your life. Ooh, wow. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Or it, let me let me let, let me do something actually more storyteller. What makes you remember the best wave of your life? It is a sound, it is a, an image, it is a smell, it is something else. Think about it. Yeah, I you know I when I think of waves, I think of waves gone wrong that stand out more than waves, <laughs> right? Um, but when I think of the the best, I think of, um, I actually think of a session I had here in Santa Barbara a long time ago. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier of wanting someone there. Because there's a little point break here that's kind of fickle. Um, but every now and then, if the angle's right, it'll it'll capture beautiful you know kind of endless summer style but smaller okay. <laughs> longboard waves and um there was one day where the wind switched offshore and i knew to check it and it just because that wind had switched it just turned it on and no one was around and i surfed for hours and it was one of those days where i kept thinking i wish someone was here <laughs> just to, be so fun to share this these perfect keeling endless summer waves and i'm on this old you know single fin log and it was magical um and so i guess to answer the other part of the question that when the winds turned offshore my brain definitely you know the hair kind of raises on the back of my neck and i start thinking oh okay cleaning up where i wonder where you know there could be something special happening that nobody's thinking of looking at or checking and um you know but those i think there's something about surf filmmaking a lot of people ask me how do you how do you sit behind a camera as opposed to surf mm -hmm. and there's an excitement to getting it you know i i'm not a hunter i like fishing so it's a little like that when you know you finally get that thing and it's all happening and and there's a real magic to it, it coming together because the surfer's got to be surfing well mother nature has to be turned on not so crowded that nobody can get waves your camera gears on in the film days yeah. that was really important 
And then you're on as a camera person, you know? I mean, I've had those days on film where every time someone gets a good wave, the film rolls out, you know, or <laughs> you're changing a battery or whatever it is. Yeah. Like, there's a sync that has to come together. And I think for me, that one session is a little about that. It's that having all these things kind of come together in a perfect way that it's one that I do think about often. And I still surf that spot. And so it's always like, oh, that one day. <laughs> one day <with> that. <laughs> definitely definitely <laughs> fantastic so we're going to finish our interview with a short Q&A session so please answer the first thing that comes up to your mind questions are standard everybody answer to them um, okay. first uh, the best surfboard that you ever ridden you know the board Tyler made me when we finished single thing yellow was a replica of the board that's in the film, but tuned a little more for my size. And and I had sessions on that board that I, yeah, I'm still dreaming about. So uh, it was a Tyler Point glass in fin. Um, I think we went nine, eight. My nephew, Connor Coffin, has it now in his garage. I, I gifted it to him, but uh, okay. yeah. Good. Uh, make sure that he keeps it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I may go steal it back. I was thinking about that the other day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I think preser surfboard preservation is another topic, you know, before mm -hmm. they get lost mm -hmm. somewhere and you're going to regret it. So if I ask you the, your favorite shaper, I guess we are there, right? <laughs> well, I, it's, that's a hard question because I have so many good friends who are shapers, you know. Um, Tyler and I have obviously had a, a wonderful relationship and um, uh, for many years, he's built me beautiful boards and um, I'm very fortunate, you know, cause he's a busy guy, but I love, you know, I've been riding Josh Hall's boards more now as I've gotten older and um, they're amazing. There's just, um, there's so many talented people up here. Michael Arnall is a guy out of Ventura building just beautiful boards. Um, so, you know, I, I hate to pinpoint one Dane Purley in San Diego and, uh, you know, all the people who've been in my movies, Bo Young's building a beautiful board. So, yeah, was, uh, you know, you're, you're asking me to like choose what child I like. More. <laughs> That's not <laughs> totally fair. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble at all. So it's okay. <laughs> one guy, you know, one guy I'd like to give a shout out to is Matt Calvani, who has the Bing label now out of San Diego. When he was a young shaper for Phil Becker, he would allow me to come, and this was before I was making anything or knew much. I just wanted to learn about surfing, and he would let me hang out in Shaping Bay. And he would mow foam for, he could do six boards in a day. And I would just sit there and watch and ask questions. And he was so generous. So I need to thank him because I think that got me thinking about, you know, the film, the type of films I wanted to make and paying tribute to surfboard builders and, the, you know, the history there and the, the culture. Yeah, definitely. I would like to interview Matt. I, I interviewed Big Copeland, and mm -hmm. uh, it was very interesting to uh, understand why he chose Matt. Obviously, because mm -hmm. he's a great uh, surfboard shaper, but because he said, I know that he would, together with his wife, uh, preserve Bing yeah. for the future. And I think it was very important, you know, like to, to hear that because Bing is part of history. And uh, if you yeah. think about uh, uh, longboard, uh, uh, amazing, amazing boards that came out from 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 being yeah. Copeland and the story. But anyway, yeah. amazing. And uh, personal question: Your favorite song? Oh, jeez, these are hard. <laughs> yeah, but I want to do <laughs> favorite or kind song. of music you like to hear? Yeah, well, I'm a uh, you know. Some people find this surprising. I'm a closet Jimmy Buffett fan. Um, not so closet for those who know me well, but I also credit him to maybe ruining my Hollywood career because I think I saw this guy with no shoes going from beach town to beach town creating art. And I thought, gosh, I, that seems pretty darn cool. Um, so yeah, I, you know, a Tin Cup Chalice by Jimmy Buffett is one that I can, I'll stop and sing the, the words to that song any time of day. I think it just, there's a few songs, there's a lot of commercial stuff he's done that I'm not a fan of, but a few of the older songs that just transport me, whether it's to a, a boat or a harbor or a beach around the bend that there's no people at. His music was a big part of 
kind of our early exploration into Baja that I would do with my friends when we were young and and didn't know much of anything. And so I think when I hear it, it it, it just kind of pulls me into that okay. space. So, okay. Favorite subspot. I mean, if if we can get rid of all the people Rincon, <laughs> pretty darn special. <laughs> okay. And even okay. with even with the people, it's pretty darn special, and it's why we live about five minutes away. I, I uh, yeah. You know, you talk about surf sessions. I think I've had some of my best surfs there through the years, and uh, it's just uh, it's pretty magical to to run a the right hand point so long that when you kick out, your legs are just burning, and you know, you've got nothing left. Favorite surfer of all time? Mm. I, I mean, my love of riding big heavy boards is hard because it influences the answer. Um, but honestly, I, I think, you know, having watched a lot of people surf through a camera, Tom Curran, you know, I'm from that Tom Curran era. And even when I'm on a longboard, I think of his flow and, um, you know, his hand placement. And there's just such a beauty to his just like symmetry with the wave, you know, mm. um, he's riding with waves, but it's such a critical high performance level um, that I find that beautiful and could yeah. watch it all day long, you know, all day long. Yeah. And, uh, uh, against the Aussie, a uh, few, few weeks ago, right. They did, uh, uh yeah. it was amazing to, to, to see. And with the black beauty, that's the board. So that's, um, the, board. that's the board. Um, okay. The last question is a little bit unusual. As I said, we ask everybody on this show, but as you are a father, you have two kids, uh, wife, so um, we want to know your best relationship advice. Ooh, I think you know you uh, you need to remember in life everybody's different, and uh, I think accepting people for who they are, whether they're your own kids or the person you meet at the grocery store, um, goes a long way for all of us. And you know, and hopefully uh, there's reciprocation. You know, and we all. I think in a family dynamic, um, you obviously have goals and you have needs and it can be stressful, but, um, you know, appreciating each person for who they are and, and what's important to them and, and reminding yourself that, uh, and then doing your best to, you know, to, to make it all work. Cause obviously kids ask for things that we <laughs> can't always give them. Uh, and them. <laughs> sometimes as, as adults, we ask for things that we're not going to get, you know, and, um, my, my wife has a great joke when our kids are kind of being la loud or wild or whatever it is. And I want to get mad, like sit down and eat dinner or whatever. She's like, yeah, just stop being kids. And it's such a good reminder, right? Because you know, I'm a big kid at heart and yeah, they should be kids. And sometimes yeah. being a kid is being whatever a parent doesn't really want at that time, but that's okay too. You know, I think, and not to get too off topic, but we're, you know, we're in a, um, an ever evolving world where it, things are a lot more complicated. I think as humans, you know, I, if we were all just roaming around living by campfires and, you know, <laughs> foraging for food, it might be better for our brain state, but we've evolved to where we're at and we're now fitting into these various things. And so it's just good to remind ourselves that everybody's trying to do the best they can and, uh, get through it, you know? Yeah. We have only one chance in our life to be kids, so we need to, uh, uh, yeah. uh, you know, take advantage of that and that yeah. actually that free spirit because we can be kids as an adult, but at the end of the day, we have still a job to do at nine o'clock in the morning, or if you are lucky, Very true. eleven. <laughs> so, Very true. Je Jason, thank you so much. Grazie mille for being yeah, uh, with me today, and I look forward to talk to you very soon. Absolute pleasure. Take care and thanks for doing these. It's really fun, you know. Appreciate Thank you. It. Ciao. Bye yeah. bye. Ciao. Hi, it's me again. I hope you enjoyed our today's episode. If you want to know more about us, please follow www.thetempleofsurf.com and all our social media. Mahalo.